you may see a little pop up letting you know, but we are being recorded. So just letting everybody know that. Um, secondly, this, as I said, because this is being recorded, all of our recordings for all of these webinars that I've been doing twice a week for the last several, several weeks, um, they are all being recorded. They all live on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to put a link in the chat right now to our YouTube channel. So please feel free to check that out. And there may be other recordings there that you're interested in, or if you wanted to share this one with other friends and family, uh, feel free to direct them to our YouTube channel. If you have a question, please use the Q&A box. That'll let everybody else see your question and also makes it easier for us to find them all. Sometimes questions can get lost in the chat, but we'll make sure to answer them wherever we see them uh, at the end of the presentation. It's a little hard to go back and forth between the presentation and the Q&A box. So for your safety, um, hopefully you should only be able to see what I post in chat, but just in case I missed a setting somewhere, don't click on links other than what I may post in the chat. Now um, on the TCF side of things, the Conservation Foundation, these webinars are offered to the public for free. However, we do encourage you to consider a donation or a membership that helps us to keep doing what we do. At the end of the webinar, you'll be taken to our website. Feel free to explore the plethora of information contained there for homeowners, landowners, municipalities, and everybody else. Uh, also, Giving DuPage Days is a 30-day online fundraiser through DuPage County to support local nonprofit organizations that serve DuPage County. So I'm gonna put a link to that, to our page on that in the chat right now as well. There's that one. Now we have some upcoming webinars, as I mentioned. Um, we're, I'm doing these twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays at one o'clock central time. So coming up on Monday, May 11th is our conservation at home webinar. So that's our, I, I've done this one before. So if you've seen it already, it will be a repeat. Um, but it's just a general introduction to our conservation at home program. Then on Thursday of next week, we have planting a pollinator garden. This is another one that I think may be quite popular. So I do encourage you to register early and make sure to get here uh, a few minutes in advance just to make sure that you can get in. So those are the two upcoming ones, conservation at home on Monday and planting a pollinator garden on Thursday. So without further ado, it is time now to get into the meat of our presentation. And unlike many of our webinars today, I am not going to be the one giving it. I'm going to introduce Connie, who is one of the educators at TCF, who also works with the Resiliency Institute, which is an edible landscaping organization. They promote edible landscaping, um, permaculture, that sort of thing um, to the general public. So Connie, I'm going to ask you if you can go ahead and turn your camera on now. Can you get your... Um, it says, actually it says that you need to do it. It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, go ahead and try it now. There we go. There we are. All Hi, right, everyone. welcome Connie. Thank you, Jamie. I am excited to be here, you guys. I am, um, I'm very excited. I, I told Jamie before, I've been enjoying thoroughly all of the, um, all of the webinars that have been posted. I've been trying to watch a couple of them live and then some others um, on the recordings on YouTube. There've been some really great topics. So I'm excited to get to be a part of it today. I'm, um, I'm very excited to be here. So I'm actually going to share my screen and get started right away. Um, bring this up. Okay. So today we're going to talk about edible native landscaping. And I'm going to do just a couple of brief introductory things quickly before I get into the specifics on the plants. 
So first of all, um, for those who are not familiar, I want to just do a quick introduction for the Conservation Foundation. Um, we are a 501c3 since 1972, and our mission is to improve the health of our communities by preserving and restoring natural areas and open space, protecting rivers and watersheds, and promoting stewardship of our environment. We are also very proud to be accredited by the Land Trust Alliance, which is very exciting. And the reason what we do here is so important is because we're working to preserve our quality of life. So we are trying to protect our protect the water quality that's good for our wildlife, like we'll be talking about today, but it, it's also good for us because we're talking about our own drinking water. Um, we're protecting our air quality, wildlife habitat, which we'll definitely talk about today, and just um, making sure we're preserving areas so people can enjoy the outdoors and conserving these spaces so that our future generations can use them and enjoy them and enjoy their quality of life. So it's very important work. And then to introduce myself briefly, as Jamie touched on, um, I'm an educator, an environmental educator with the Conservation Foundation. And as part of that, um, along with the other educators, I will be helping to facilitate nature on the farm summer camps for kids. So I would definitely keep an eye on the website for updates in terms of COVID and things will be following all regulations, but I just want to um, Get that out there and have some fun activities hopefully that we'll be able to do in in some way that is still um, following everything we need to do safety wise but the conservation foundation main office is located at Mac, uh, mcdonald farm in naperville it's a 60 acre working organic farm and um it's a really nice oops sorry my video there um really nice property and if you are in the area if you live in the area you're local or if you're passing through and visiting during regular business hours you can um, stop by the farm and check things out there's a nice pond and a wetland area and some different habitats and um, there's a garden that i'm going to tell you about in just a second um, that's another thing i do i've got where it says try on here that's the resiliency institute that jamie mentioned and i teach permaculture gardening classes there and permaculture, if you're not familiar with it, is basically um, permaculture gardening is gardening in a way that mimics natural systems, mimics nature. Um, we want to work with nature and not against it, but that's where the landscaping and the gardening comes into place. It's not a total wild area, it's one of our cultivated areas, but we're trying to mimic nature and be respectful and provide habitat. And then I also teach at College of DuPage in the Sustainable Urban Agriculture Department. So those three things come together and that's what makes today's webinar. This is what we're gonna be talking about. We're bringing all those things together. So we'll be talking about nature and the environment and wildlife and we'll be talking about food and we'll be talking about bringing those things together in our yard. So um, let me go ahead and get right to it here. So, <laughs> edible native landscaping. Why? <laughs> Why are we talking about this? Why is this even an interesting thing? First of all, foraging has become very popular recently in recent years. And a question I get asked all the time is, where am I allowed to forage? Um, you, you cannot, please do not <laughs> take things from forest preserves, most national parks and a lot of other places, you, you really should not be taking anything. And it is illegal in many places to remove anything. You don't want to forage in those spaces. So where can you forage? Where is it okay? Well, our yards. <laughs> so if you're planting some of these native plants in your own yard as part of your landscaping to beautify your space, but you're also supporting nature and you can forage from it and get some edible food for yourself as well, then that's just a win-win. Um, another reason this is really a popular idea is um, a lot of people are, well, like me, <laughs> I love um, I love trying new things, do new different types of foods, new, different flavors, and um, different varieties of things that you would never find in the grocery stores. So things that, that you're not going to find elsewhere, but if you're growing it in your yard, um, then you, you have access to that. And when we're planting um, native plants also, so it sounded like some of you or most of you are at least a little bit familiar with the importance of planting native plants. 
one thing in terms of our own landscaping, we're busy, you know, we have these go, go, go lifestyles. It, it would be nice if we can bring that down a notch and have some time for relaxation. Part of that though is reducing our workload. So if we're planting things in our yard that are low maintenance, that helps us out immensely um, in terms of the upkeep of our, of our outdoor spaces in our yards. So native plants are generally very low maintenance and a lot of them are just absolutely beautiful. So they're great for landscaping. Um, native plants also support our local wildlife, our native wildlife. Um, you know, over time, animals and insects and plants have developed together. They have um, evolved together. And so a lot of them have very specific relationships. Um, I'm sure most people are probably familiar with monarchs and milkweed and that monarchs lay their eggs on the milkweed plants and the milkweed um, is the food for the caterpillars. And there are a lot of relationships like that where our native wildlife relies on a native plant to support it and bringing something else in that's exotic doesn't necessarily offer maybe the right um, protection from predators for nesting birds, for example, or the right foods for pollinators or other animals. So. Um, by planting natives, we're also supporting our wildlife. And that adds to our enjoyment as well. If we're sitting in our yards and watching, you know, looking over our space and observing, it's fun to watch the wildlife and the critters moving around and going about their business. And it, it's stress relieving for us. And it's good to be able to support those ecosystems right in our own outdoor spaces and be guardians of that space and protectors of all of these other plants, um, the plants and animals and insects that live there. Another thing, and this is very important, when you are foraging in your own yard, you're much, it, it's safer in that if you are not 100% sure on a plant ID, you absolutely should never eat it. So I need to stress that, that's very important. Um, it's, even if you do know a plant pretty well, so, I have a picture up here on the screen of elderberry, and very commonly I see people confuse pokeberries with elderberries. You do not want to eat pokeberries. Um, elderberries are okay, but even elderberries, you need to know your plants because you need to know this is not a fresh eating berry. They need to be cooked or they need to be processed. Um, so it's not a good idea to try to, you know, to ever taste anything or eat anything if you're not 100% sure what it is. And while you're learning, if you have purchased something from a reliable, trustworthy source, and you know this is elderberry, it was labeled elderberry, and they told you it's elderberry, and you planted elderberry, then you, you have less of a question as you're learning. You know what it is, you can label it, it's right there. Um, and that really helps to cut down on any mistaken identities or, or maybe trying the wrong thing. So um, I can't stress that enough. Please don't ever eat anything if you're not 100% sure that, that your ID is accurate. And um, on that note also, oh, you know what, I'll, I'll get to that. Well, I'm gonna go here to the next screen. Um, oops, I went, skipped a couple. So what I'm going to do today is talk about some of the more familiar plants, um, some things that people might be a little more familiar with, some things that you might already have in your yard. If not, hopefully you'll want to add them. And also some of the things that are coming up right now in our area, um, our area meaning Northern Illinois, but also a lot of you who are coming from surrounding areas will have a lot of the same or similar um, plants, maybe not all of them, but there will definitely be crossover and and you'll be seeing some of these same plants. Um, there are so, so many plants that I would love to talk to you all about. Um, I really had to try to narrow it down so we can fit into the time that we have. So um, this is really going to be more of an introduction and an overview. And like I said, hopefully you'll learn something new about some plants that you might already be familiar with, or maybe, um, maybe you'll learn a whole new plant and hopefully we'll get, um, get you inspired and maybe you can add some of these things to your yards. So I'm going to start with black walnut. And <clears throat> when, we, 
When we eat walnuts, the ones that we get from the store typically are English walnuts. The black walnut that we have growing here that is native is um, the nut itself is very similar. It's the same thing. They're, they're very closely related. However, the English walnut is much easier to crack and that tends to be, you know, that's the one that is used mostly for commercial production. Um, the other thing too with black walnut is it tends to get a little bit of a bad rap, not, not necessarily, um, people tend to want to avoid it because of black walnut toxicity. Black walnuts have a chemical called juglones in their, um, in the tree, it's in the nuts, the leaves, the, the roots, and it's in the ground. It works kind of as a natural um, herbicide. So from the black walnuts perspective, it's kind of reducing its competition and making sure it doesn't get crowded and that you know all these things aren't growing underneath it necessarily. However, um, the other side of that story that a lot of people don't know or don't realize is that um, there are a lot of plants that are not sensitive to those jug loans. So that's where I feel like it sometimes kind of gets a bad rap because sure, there are certain things that won't grow under a black walnut. If you're trying to grow a vegetable garden, tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, those are very sensitive. They will not do well under a black walnut tree. However, there is a huge list of plants that will do well. I'm gonna give you just a few of them here, um, right? Just as examples, service berry, pawpaw, hawthorn, hickories, red buds, persimmons, wild plums, hazelnut, elderberry, wild black raspberry, wild grapes, wild ginger, may apples, violets. A lot of plants do perfectly well underneath the black walnut and incidentally, every single one that I just named, those are all edible or they have edible parts. So it is definitely possible to incorporate these things into your yard, um, especially in more of a natural setting or in more of a foraging type of a garden rather than you know, your tomatoes in a raised bed, for example, you might not want under your tree. Um, the black walnuts also, so actually the link I have here on this, on this slide is for the Morton Arboretum. They have a list on their website that's a really good resource for checking um, for, to see what plants are sensitive and what plants are not sensitive to walnut toxicity. So that's a link for that. And um, in terms of our wildlife value with this tree, black walnut attracts over 100 species of butterflies and moths and feeds them. So they, the caterpillars will feed on the leaves and um, that includes the luna moth, which is pictured in the center at the bottom. That is such a beautiful moth. Um, I remember the first one I saw in person, I was in Southern Illinois and it landed right in front of me um, underneath a porch light. And it was, they're, they're very large. If you haven't seen one in person, they are such a sight to see. They're really cool. And they like black walnut trees. So that, that's a benefit right there for me as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so, as I mentioned, the nuts themselves are good raw. You can eat them just like regular walnuts. I actually this morning had banana pancakes for breakfast with black walnuts in them. Um, and that wasn't even on purpose. That was just, that happened to be, that's what I had today. They were delicious. So they're also good in baking. Um, nuts are good, you know, anything you can top off your muffins or put them in your pancakes. Um, anything that you would use, walnuts that you buy from the store in, you can use black walnuts in. And the only difficult thing there, and this is maybe another reason that it's not as popular, I mentioned that they're hard to shell. It's very hard to crack the shells and get the nuts out. And so when you do get them out, they also have all these little compartments inside. So the nuts themselves, as you get them out, they're in small pieces. So it's not as easy to get like a full half of a nut like, like you sometimes might buy. They're generally in small little pieces. They're delicious. They are nutritious. Um, so if you're able to get through the husk and then get through the shell, it's, it's worth it. Handling the husks, you need to be careful or wear gloves because they will stain. They'll stain your hands, your clothes. It's a dark brown walnut stain. And um, sometimes people to get the, the husk off will even put them on the driveway and run them over with their car back and forth and back and forth to get that husk peeled off um, once the, the nuts are 
closer to ripe and that that outside can get pretty hard as well which is what's shown on the lower right that green is what they look like on the tree inside of that green husk is the brown shell that we're familiar with which is pictured all the way on the left um, i mentioned on here also nocino so if you don't want to go to the trouble of trying to get that husk off and get the nuts out of the shell there is an italian liqueur made with green walnuts that are still in the husk and they are unripe. So that's something interesting too, that you don't even need to worry about trying to remove any of that or go through that, um, you know, trying to get down to the nut. You just use that whole green thing in the husk and um, they make a liqueur out of it, a nutty flavored liqueur. So the next one, what I tried to do was pick a few trees, a few shrubs and a few lower like herbaceous plants. Um, to go over today. So the next one I have is a hickory. And hickory also has a bit of that same toxicity effect that the walnut does that, that is common to both of these trees. These trees are so beautiful in the landscape. They've got a really rich golden color leaves in the fall. And as you can see in the center picture here, they have this really cool looking peeling bark. That's a shag bark hickory. And um, the interesting thing about this tree is that not only are the nuts edible, but you can also make some things with the bark as well. So I'll talk about that in just a second. Um, the hickory nuts are a sweeter flavor than a walnut, and they're much easier to get out of the shell. Um, there are a lot of wildlife that like actually both the walnuts and hickory. So um, things like woodpeckers, squirrels, um, Actually, eastern screech owls really like to roost in black walnut trees. And um, there are, let's see, turkeys, raccoons, even foxes and rabbits, chipmunks, blue jays, um, red-bellied and downy woodpeckers. They all really enjoy these trees. So um, the, what I was gonna tell you about the bark here, that's really cool. So the way the bark is, on this, um, on this picture, you can see how it's just, it looks shredded, like it's just coming off the tree. I definitely would not recommend peeling bark off of any tree. We don't want to damage any of our plants or any of our trees. However, as it sheds this bark, and you can pick some up when it's fallen and it just is right on the ground, right underneath the base of the tree, there's a hickory syrup that is made with it. So that's what's shown here on the right. It kind of looks like honey. Um, to make that syrup, you take those pieces of bark and bake it in the oven and that kind of kills any, you know, if there are microorganisms or things like that in it and it gives it a nice toasted, roasty flavor um, and fragrance. And so then you take that and put it in boiling water. You boil it for a while and it really gets a lot of that flavor out into the water. Then you remove the bark and you can add sugar and boil that mixture down into a syrup and have a really good um, toasted hickory flavored syrup, which is really, um, it's very tasty. Um, and of course, you know, if, if a branch comes down in, in a storm or anything like that, you can use that as well. People like to make hickory smoked everything. Um, so if you're cooking out or like to roast or smoke any of your foods, hickory is often used for that. So this is one that um, is blooming right now, my redbud tree in my backyard. The flowers just opened up and yesterday it was just beautiful. This is one of my favorite trees in the springtime. And um, since it is a spring flowering tree, that means it's early food for a lot of our pollinators. So um, redbud attracts native bees and also the bumblebees tend to like it quite a bit. And then songbirds like it. I have a lot of chickadees in my redbud tree and um, other songbirds will, will come and go through the tree. Uh, I haven't seen any nesting in mine, but they do enjoy the tree very much. Um, also quail, which I think is really cool. I don't have any right where I live, but if I was in an area where they were around, they really enjoy um, redbud trees. So like a Bob White. And um, the flowers are edible. They are high in vitamin C, and they're such a really pretty color that they are often used in baking. Um, 
sometimes they the flowers themselves are sugared and used to top bakery like cupcakes and things like that. Um, they can be made into a jelly or a syrup and you can just eat them fresh. You can just sprinkle them on top of the salad. They add a nice pretty color. Um, the picture in the center there is a red bud jelly. You can see that color is just beautiful. And then the other thing that's edible with this tree are the little seed pods. So it gets these little little flat, they almost look like a pea, um, kind of like a, you know, the flat peas that you would use in a stir fry or like a snow pea. And when those young little seed pods are first forming and they're pale green and they're still soft, they will get harder later on. But when they're young, when they are first formed, you can pick those and eat them. You can eat them raw in a salad or you can saute them. You can add them to a stir fry, kind of like, um, like wild peas right off of the tree in your backyard, which is pretty cool. So that's a really fun one. So this next one, the hawthorn. Obviously in the name, we've got the word thorn in the name and hawthorns are thorny trees. There are certain, um, there are different varieties of hawthorns and some have fewer thorns than others. So like the native downy hawthorn has fewer thorns. Um, there are some varieties that don't have thorns, but um, the thorns are actually, even though we might not like to think of having thorn plants around because we don't want to hurt ourselves when we're out in our yards, if we have a place that we can put this, you know, where it's not, where we're not going to bump into it or we're brushing right past it often, you can put it in, you know, an area that is appropriate for it in your yard, plants that tend to have those thorns are really good protection for nesting birds. So those thorns actually serve a really good purpose. And um, if you have a place that you can put one, it's a great, it's a great tree to have. So again, a lot of these um, that I'm talking about today are going to be flowering now in the spring. And if there's a plant that has a fruit, it starts off with the flower. So a lot of those that are edible to us because they have fruit start off with providing food for our pollinators in the spring. So right now they've got these beautiful flowers and all of our early, um, early pollinators as they are emerging are able to get pollen and nectar from, from these plants. So um, one thing that's really fun about this one too is that hummingbirds and butterflies really enjoy these. And so a lot of times when we're thinking about our pollinators, we are thinking more of our bees, even you know our native bees or honeybees, which are not native, but um, bumblebees and, and things like that. But we tend to forget that there are other types of pollinators. There are flies and moths and some of our birds and um, butterflies. So this is a really good plant to have for, for those hawthorn trees. And in addition to having the spring flowers and then the fruit in the summer, which can be used by us, the fruit stays on the tree well into the colder weather. And so it attracts birds in the winter. Um, pictured here is, I'm not sure if it's a cedar waxwing or if it's a bohemian waxwing, they're very similar, but anyway, it's a waxwing, it's a beautiful bird. And they really love the winter fruit. Um, you know, when food is more scarce in the winter, these types of plants are very important for a wildlife. And then for us, for our own personal usage, um, these little fruits, which, you know, they kind of look like berries, but they're actually in some ways a little more similar to like a tiny little crab apple. Um, not really sure how to describe it, but they've been used for years and years, for hundreds, thousands even, I don't even know, but they've been used traditionally um, medicinally for a lot of different purposes, but they're also, in addition to being a medicinal plant, which that's a whole nother webinar, they are edible. So things that are commonly made with the hawthorn fruit would be jellies, syrup. Um, a lot of times people will make an infused honey, which just means picking the fruit and you pour honey over it and you let it just get all of the good nutrition from the fruit into the honey and it gets flavored and colored from the fruit. Um, Hawthorn is very high in vitamin C. And if you do that same type of infusion, but with vinegar instead of honey, that is actually a really good way to preserve that vitamin C. So this would be a good thing to have in the winter, maybe when we're not, we don't have as many 
um, fresh fruits and vegetables, at least from our own gardens. I guess we can get it from the grocery store, but preserving some of that in a vinegar and then using it as a salad dressing, um, that's a great way to use the fruit from the hawthorn. And then people also like to make cordials and liqueurs and um, tea is made often from the leaves, the flowers and the fruit. So it, all around, it's a really good plant. Next one, this is a gooseberry. Um, you know what I wanted to mention before when I mentioned the Resiliency Institute is that on McDonald Farm, so I mentioned the Conservation Foundation's main location is there at McDonald Farm in Naperville and the Conservation Foundation was gracious enough to provide the Resiliency Institute with space to grow this edible forest garden that Jamie mentioned. and. So this picture on the lower right is a gooseberry that's in the garden there. So uh, I actually had a video too, and I, I maybe should have put up the video clip instead of the photo, but it was just covered in pollinators. There were bees, uh, so many different kinds, even just all over. Those flowers look pretty small and not very big or showy, but wow, did the pollinators love them. It was just covered when I was there the other day. So um, yeah, if you're able to go and walk through that garden, the Resiliency Institute's Edible Forest Garden, you'll see examples actually of a few of the plants I'll be talking about today. And this picture on the lower right was taken in that garden. So um, during regular business hours, if you're in the area, go and explore the garden. It's, it's a really nice space and it's a good example of what some of these plants can look like in your landscape. So gooseberries, we don't wanna confuse those with another fruit called a cape gooseberry. A Cape gooseberry you'll sometimes see in grocery stores, not very often, but sometimes I've seen them at Trader Joe's or um, at Caputo's near us. And um, those are actually a ground cherry, which is funny because it's not a gooseberry, it's not a cherry. <laughs> they're actually much more um, similar to a tomatillo, but they're sweet. So that's what a Cape gooseberry is. And this is not that. These gooseberries, um, these are closely related to currants. And we do also have a wild black currant in this area. It's not very common, but um, there is a native currant also, um, which I can talk more about that another time. But the gooseberries right now are blooming. The fruit will come in the summer. They make a delicious jam or jelly. They do have tiny little seeds, so you can either remove those if you want a jelly or you can use the full fruit. Um, as you can see in that center picture, they kind of look like a little grape almost is what they're like. And they're very sweet, so they're good for fresh eating. Some can be a little tart, but they are, um, as opposed to some fruit where you really need to sweeten it or process it in some way. And it's, it, you know, they might not be the best for fresh eating. Gooseberries really are. You can just eat them right off the bush. They are thorny though, so it's a little bit difficult to harvest them. Um, and wildlife loves this fruit. so. A lot of times, if you're in the woods, you've probably seen gooseberries, the plants, but maybe didn't realize what it was, especially this time of year or, or um, you know, a couple of weeks ago when they're not fully, when they don't have all of their leaves, you'll just see a stick that is covered in thorns. That might have been a gooseberry. Um, they, so you have to watch out for that when you're picking the berries, but the uh, wildlife of all kinds love the fruit. So it's a valuable food source for birds, our native bees, as I mentioned, because they're pollinating out there right now, chipmunks, and also ground squirrels. So this picture on the lower left, um, it's actually not the best picture. I'm not entirely 100% even sure that that is a ground squirrel. It might be something else like, I don't know, some kind of a closely related animal. But in my yard, I do have ground squirrels. It's a 13 striped ground squirrel and they are the cutest things. Um, they pop up out of the ground and duck down in and they they burrow under there you know as opposed to a tree squirrel these ground squirrels live underground and it's kind of like if anyone has ever seen the show meerkat manor that's what it's like watching these little guys out there they're adorable so i i love that they like the gooseberries and i'm happy to share with them um, but gooseberries because it is a sweet fruit you can use them for jam jelly um, baking again, people make pies with them, all kinds of crumbles or cobblers. And an interesting thing about these plants is that the currants and gooseberries being closely related, um, a long time ago, there was, um, there was an issue where 
it was found that they carried a fungal disease that was affecting pines. And so the, um, the gooseberries and currants were banned in the United States because it was, they were considered a threat to the logging industry. And since then, more studies have been done and they have lifted the ban and uh, they really realized that completely trying to eradicate or get rid of those plants didn't really help much anyway. And um, so anyway, a lot of times I'll hear people say, oh, my grandma grew gooseberries. Like people used to be really familiar with this, but not so much anymore because they went away for a long time. So if you travel to other places um, in, especially in Europe, in Ireland, Scotland, England, Wales, that whole area over there, gooseberries are so common. You'll see them everywhere. So they're, um, you know, you'll get breakfast in the morning and you're served gooseberry jelly and they have gooseberry or currant flavored yogurt and all kinds of different things that are just commonplace. They're much more common there than they are here. And that's, that's the reason. So um, it would be really nice to have them become more popular again because it's a really great plant. Service berry is one that is blooming right now, and this is one of the best summer fruits for birds. It attracts at least 35 different species of birds, including catbirds, orioles, gross beaks, thrushes. Um, so it's a, it's a very valuable plant for that purpose, and it's just beautiful. And if you're not familiar with the name service berry, you may have heard of June berries. It's the same, the same plant. There are a lot of different varieties of service berries, which is really nice because when we're talking about landscaping in our yards, that gives you so many options. You can, you know, there are different heights and widths and sizes and, um, and shapes, you know, some are more like a small tree and some are more like a, a shrub. And um, so there, you have a lot of choices. So you can hopefully find one that fits in your space and fits in your yard. Um, they're also host to several butterfly and moth species, including tiger swallowtails, which I should have put a picture of those up. They're beautiful, yellow and black butterfly, viceroys, and also sphinx moths, all kinds of really cool things. And in addition, these berries are highly nutritious for us. So studies have shown that they actually contain more vitamin C, fiber, iron, protein, and antioxidants than blueberries. So they can be considered a superfood. These are, are highly nutritious. Um, in terms of what we do with them, this is one of those plants, like I mentioned, where um, they're not really the best for fresh eating. Like you wouldn't necessarily always just pick the berries and snack on them, although they can vary a lot from plant to plant and from one variety to the next. So some actually might be better for snacking. They might taste good and sweet and, and you can just snack on them. Um, some maybe wouldn't be, they might be a little more tart. And so then that's when you can make something like a jam, um, you know, kind of like some of these others where I've mentioned where some of the most popular things to do with them are to make jams or jellies or to bake with them, put them in muffins like a blueberry and that type of thing. You can put them in smoothies. Um, the possibilities are endless. You can do anything with them that you can do with most berries. So this one is interesting to me. I feel like a lot of people are not familiar with this, even though we're familiar with plums, a lot of people don't know that there's a native version. So this may not be appropriate for everyone's yard or every space. Um, they do tend to send up suckers and form a thicket, which again, if we remember, that's what sometimes can make it a great habitat plant. So it really provides protection from all the little critters that live in there and for nesting birds. And of course, they love to eat the fruit. Um, but in the, in the right place, this is a really nice plant to have. And it's also because of those suckers and that thicket forming habit, it can be really good for erosion control. So depending on what your outdoor space looks like, that could really come in handy. Sometimes um, that's an important thing to have. So they're really pretty in our landscapes in the fall. They get this beautiful maroon fall color um, and spring flowers, pretty white flowers in the spring and the butterflies and pollinators love it. And I mentioned the birds love the fruit when the fruit is um, ripe. And you can see in this picture on the, the lower left, the color of the plums. So it's not like the dark plums, um, you know, some of the varieties that you might purchase are more the blue or the red or those types of things. These are more of a golden color with a blush. They've got some pink and pinky purple magenta fuchsia colors to them. And they're, they're really pretty fruit as well. And these are very good for fresh eating. 
they are small, so they're not going to be quite as big as the plums that you would find in the store. Um, they are more, oh, I'm trying to think of what might be similar, like an Italian prune. Those are a little bit smaller coming right off of the tree. Um, and so these, um, these can be like a small tree or a large shrub. And again, forming those thickets when they send up those suckers, um, this is one plant where some people, again, it kind of goes in that thorny category, but they don't, they don't technically have thorns, but they have very kind of little pokey sticks in there that may as well be. Um, so again, great habitat, but maybe if it's off on an edge or somewhere that works for you, it's, it's a really good one to have. And then in addition to the fresh eating, because it is a sweet plum, um, you can make pies with them, preserves, the picture on the lower right is something that I really like to make with them. I make it um, later on in the in the late fall. It's a spiced plum preserve. So you just mix in your cinnamon and ginger, whatever spices you like, nutmeg, um, like cloves, anything like that, those good spicy warming types of spices. And you cook down the the plums with the spices and you really don't need to add any sweetener if you want to you could add a little honey or you could sweeten it up but you really don't need it and then it just makes this really beautiful preserves and it's actually a really nice gift to give people too or it's a nice thing to serve at the holidays um, it's really nice warmed up you can put it over a little bit of like pound cake or whatever you like so again so many possibilities anything you can make with plums you can you can make with an american plum that's exactly what it is it's just our native version of some of those pretty orchard trees that we've seen. So this one is really interesting. This one needed four pictures <laughs> so I could so I could show you all the different things that are really cool about this plant. Um, first of all, it does make also a nice hedge, but this one's not thorny, so that's kind of nice. So um, it makes a good windbreak and it does provide a good habitat for a lot of our animals. And some of the animals that enjoy eating hazelnuts, which keep this in mind, that means they're also your competition if you want to eat the hazelnuts. Um, quail, again, which is very cool. Turkey, blue jays, pheasants, squirrels and chipmunks, of course, and woodpeckers, mice, deer, all kinds of things do like to eat hazelnut. Um, and so another consideration with that is um, trying to get, um, because they all like this food and they're gonna to try to get to it and we're gonna to try to get to it. Some of these things like squirrels will actually eat the hazelnuts before they're even ripe. So that can be hard. So one thing that, that you might want to do if you want to get hazelnuts for yourself and provide for the wildlife, because that's the goal here, is to plant several of the shrubs and then you know maybe have one that you protect somehow a little bit more um, to try to make sure that you get some of those hazelnuts for yourself and then leave the others for the wildlife. And, you know, everybody gets their fair share. We can, we can share that way. Um, there are hybrid hazelnuts that have been crossed with a Chinese hazelnut, and those are used more for agricultural purposes. It's a larger nut. So when, when the main goal is to try to produce them for food for humans, that's the way um, it's normally done because it's a larger nut. When we're doing the native ones, the nuts are a little bit smaller, uh, maybe not as highly productive, but it's still, they're delicious hazelnuts. It's a really great plant to have. They're very interesting looking in our landscapes. Um, so you can see the picture on the upper right, that's what the nuts look like before they're quite ripe. And they have the this just cool, frilly, fringy looking little trim around it. They look like flowers on their own. And right below that, those are what are called catkins. So that's when the hazelnut flowers, that's actually kind of what they look like. They're they are called catkins and they hang off the branches um, before there are even any leaves out. So um, in the forest garden at McDonald Farm, the catkins were all just beautiful just a couple weeks ago. It's so pretty to see those little chains of flowers hanging off of the branches without even any leaves or anything on there yet. They're beautiful. And then the other two pictures, one of course is the hazelnuts and that's what they look like and the one in the center that's an ice cream made with hazelnut and chocolate and you can also use them to make your own homemade coffee cream um, you can make a hazelnut spread like a nutella that's what that's what's in that it's made with hazelnuts 
and all kinds of baked goods, just like any of the other nuts. Anything you can do with with the nuts, you can um, you can do with hazelnuts. They're a really good tasty nut, and these also are not anywhere near as hard to crack as like the black walnut I talked about to begin with. So, in addition to the nuts and the flowers and how pretty those are in the landscape, they also have a really beautiful fall color. So they range kind of actually like the color of those catkins there, that golden. They, they range anywhere from like a yellow to a golden orange to a really pretty copper color. Um, so they're a really pretty plant to have. And they also really have no serious pests or diseases. So again, low maintenance, easy to have in our yards. So these are some of the things that have been coming up recently. So again, I wanted to talk about some of the things that you'll see right now. A few of these you won't see all season, but you will see them right now. So wild ginger, it's actually not the same ginger plant as the ginger root you buy in the grocery store, but it does have a very similar flavor and usage. So the part that's edible, um, first I'll just say the, the picture on the lower left is what they look like in the landscape. It's a really pretty plant. It forms a beautiful ground cover. They are shade loving plants. So, you know, they'll grow in places that a lot of other things really are going to be picky about or don't want to grow in. They are tolerant of black walnuts and they don't get eaten by deer. So if that's a consideration in your space or in your yard, um, that's definitely uh, an added bonus. And so it forms that really pretty ground cover. The flowers, these plants on the left, you, you might, they might actually be flowering in this picture, but we can't tell because the flower is underneath those leaves. It's close to the ground and it's kind of cool because being down there close to the ground, that means rather than a lot of the typical pollinators that we've been talking about, like butterflies and bees, these, um, there are little flies that emerge from the soil in the spring and they will go and eat the pollen from these flowers because it's right next to the ground. Beetles, um, ants, there are all kinds of little ground loving insects that really enjoy these flowers. So, it's very interesting. You can kind of peek under the leaves like I did to take this picture. And it's it's such a pretty and unique color too. It's, it's just a very fascinating plant to me. And in this picture on the right, you can see where the arrow is pointing. So up top where there's kind of that V shape with the hairy looking stems, those are the stems, the leaves are up above, the flower is at the base, very close to the ground. And then what's at the very bottom where the arrow is pointing, um, that is actually, so the root would be under the ground. It has these little connecting pieces, rhizomes that are connecting from one plant to the next to the next. So you can actually snip pieces of that and use that as the edible part rather than digging up the plant to use the root. That way you're leaving that intact and so the, the whole ground cover of your wild ginger stays there, but you can just cut little pieces of those connecting, um, connecting pieces from one plant to the next plant. And those can be dried. You can use them as a spice. Even though it's not the same as the ginger we get in the store, it has a very similar flavor. It's that spicy, um, really tasty kind of a flavor. And uh, one thing that's done with these often is to boil it in a sugar water and it cooks down and cooks down and cooks down until you end up with a, you get little pieces of candied ginger. And then the liquid that's left is used as a ginger syrup. And then you can also dry it or you can, you can slice it into tiny little slices and crumble it and then use it as like a ginger spice. And you can add it to baking, a lot of uses. So pretty much, again, anything you would use the other ginger for, you can use this for. You don't want to have too much of it though. So it's really better to treat it more as a spice. It's more like, um, you know, a condiment rather than the meal. You don't want to eat a ton of it, but just little bits of it as a little bit of flavoring. Um, it's very nice. So we'll go on to, I've got a couple more here for you. And the next one is May apple. So <laughs> I love these plants. I, I love all these plants. I probably have said that about every slide so far, but um, the picture on the lower left is a picture I took a couple weeks ago. And this is what the May apples look like when they're kind of part way up. So they start off as this little um, 
like this little stump kind of poking through the ground, a little white and green, interesting little thing. And then at the top of that, the little umbrella leaves start to open up. So that picture was right when those little umbrella leaves were just starting to open. And there's that one in the foreground. And if you can see all those others in the background, they, they're they like, it's like a whole little party. Of, they always tend to remind people of fairies, like a fairy wood or when those little umbrellas open up, but they're like little fairy umbrellas in the woods. So they're very pretty. Again, it's another shade loving plant. So they'll grow in places that some other plants won't, which makes them really nice to fill in those areas of our landscape. And this is one also that the only part of the plant that's edible is the fruit. And it's only edible when it's fully ripe. And this, this is one where it can sometimes be hard to get that fruit, to try it, because the wildlife will beat you to it. They are out there every day. They are checking on these. It's like it's like a, their own little garden. They know when that fruit is ripe and they'll grab it. And there are quite a few um, different animals that like to eat that. And one that I think is really cool um, are box turtles. So that's that's one thing. If there are any areas where there are box turtles living in the woods, they love to eat mayapples. But in addition to that, um, opossums and skunks, raccoons, chipmunks, and even deer, they will browse these and they'll grab those little fruits and eat them as soon as they turn ripe. So um, you can have a little competition. But again, this is another benefit of having these things in our own yards. If you were you know, just assuming foraging was legal everywhere and you could pick from wherever you wanted, if you're going out to other spaces, you would have to go so often to be able to keep an eye on these things and know the plants, not only know what they look like in the different stages, but to be able to get that timing just right, to be there on the day that these are ready to eat. Um, so when you have them in your own yard, it makes that part of it much easier too, because you're able to kind of keep an eye on it and, and check it more often. And then you'll know when it's ripe, just like how the animals know that it's ripe. And then hopefully you'll get to try some <laughs> and they won't beat you to all of them. We definitely want to give them, like I said, we want to give them their fair share. This is to support them and it's kind of a bonus to us to be able to try some of these things and eat these as well. Um, Multi-purpose for sure. But um, And then these are pollinated by bumblebees and long-tongued bees. So they really like the, oh and I don't have a picture of the flower on here. It's a pretty little flower too. Um, and I should have added that. But um, look it up or look at them out in the woods. They are, they're just really pretty plants and they're visually interesting, like I said, which makes them a, a very good plant for our landscapes. A sea of little umbrellas out there is what it looks like when there's a group of them. It's, it's really cute. And so this is the last one I was going to talk about today. And these are flowering everywhere near me right now. I have these pictures actually, um, the lower right picture was taken really close to those may apples and the one on the lower left was taken in my garden and the picture in the center is a violet syrup so violets are talk about low maintenance some people consider them you know aggressive growers because they can take over a space when they're happy they will do well and they'll spread which to me makes them fantastic for a low maintenance native ground cover if they are happy and they're going to spread that's fantastic for me um, so put them in a spot where you might like to have a good, um, a good ground cover with these beautiful flowers in the spring. And there are different varieties and different colors. There are yellow violets and white violets and all different varieties of native violets. Um, again, this is another one that will grow well under a black walnut. And so this is kind of funny to me. The flowers, it's been said, some people describe them as tasting a little bit like a young mild fresh pea or like pea shoots and the thing that's funny to me about that I mean that makes them perfect for adding to a salad and they're beautiful in a salad they you know add that color it's so nice if you can put flowers in a salad it's especially you know if you're having a party or company it just kind of fancies it up a little bit it's it's fun um but the thing that's funny to me is that it makes perfect sense for a salad but most of the recipes that seem to be made with violets tend to be sweet recipes and we don't often think of sweetening our peas so that's kind of funny but um, they're definitely used to make jelly, syrup, a violet syrup is, um, is a, not only pretty, but it's tasty. It does have that floral 
flavor and with the sweetness, but it's not overpowering. It's a very fresh kind of light floral flavor and it's really good. Um, jelly is made often with violets and a simple syrup for making cocktails. So you may have seen that when you've been out to eat and at different restaurants. Um, and then also herbed butter. If you've ever seen like a, um, like a compound butter or, um, you know, where you chop up the different herbs, a lot of times it's made with maybe chives or things like that. And then you can mix in violets because it, it does have that good fresh flavor and it also adds that color. And so um, you just mix it in with the butter, you soften the butter, mix in your herbs with it, and then wrap it in like a wax paper and roll it up and put it back in the refrigerator. And then you can take slices of the butter um, that has those herbs in it. It looks very pretty. It's kind of fancy and it, it tastes really good. You can use it for cooking or use it for topping bread or, you know, anything you want. Um, and it's really good. So um, an interesting thing with violets is that um, morning doves really seem to like them. For some reason, the morning doves are really attracted to violets. Also turkeys like to eat them. Um, I have chickens and they like to eat them and rabbits and mice and caterpillars and ants. And ants actually help to spread the seeds for these as well, just like they, they also do for wild ginger. So those are some interesting things and some of the some of the wildlife that we can support by letting those violets remain in our yards instead of trying to eradicate them like some people do. I, I, I guess I don't really understand why because I think they're so pretty and they're, again, no maintenance. You get all these pretty flowers and you don't have to do anything. They just grow on their own, which is a, a big bonus for me. So. All right, I have so many more plants that I really wanted to, I, I didn't include them in the slides for today, but um, there, like I said, there are endless possibilities and there's so many more plants to talk about, but I wanted to at least talk about some of the ones, like I kind of said at the beginning, that you might be more familiar with or um, might already have, and maybe this would give you ideas for something new that you can try to do with them. Um, and yeah, so I hope I gave some people some good ideas and, and maybe inspired some things. and. Um, it's always possible to maybe I can do another one at another point with a you know a whole new set of different plants so um, yeah so I'm going to give this back to Jamie and we can do questions I want to make sure that we're okay on time I don't want to go too far over here okay thank you Connie that was awesome I've been trying to answer some questions that I know the answers to as they've yeah. been coming in um, but we do have a few questions here for you so okay. um, Going back to kind of the beginning slash middle of your presentation, um, someone asked, I just made red bud jelly with unopened blossoms, very, very mild. Is it better to use full blooms for the jelly? No, not really. Um, they're unopened blossoms are just as good as the open blossoms. They're really, the flavor isn't going to change much. Those those flower buds develop and then open so quickly, it's really only a matter of days, but they, I, they don't really get much stronger in flavor. It is very mild. Okay. Um, Randy asked, uh, do service berries att attract Japanese beetles? Not that I'm aware of. I have service berries in my yard and they do not get attacked by Japanese beetles. I haven't heard that from anyone. Um, one thing though that I, have noticed just from my own observations, I have smartweed growing in an area of my garden. I actually like it, despite the name weed being in there. I, I, it doesn't bother me at all. It popped up there on its own and I left it there specifically because the Japanese beetles love it. So I leave it there kind of as a trap plant, a trap crop, so that the Japanese beetles go to that and not my garden and not my other things. So maybe that helps, but I'm not aware of Japanese beetles attaching, uh, attacking service berries, no. I've also noticed in my yard, they go after the wild grapes a lot. True. I had, I had a you know wild grape just pop up somewhere and Japanese beetles would just annihilate that. Yeah. So if you're looking for other trap plant ideas, they go nuts for that one. Yeah, another good wild edible, <laughs> that wild grape. <laughs> um, Cindy and Roberta wanna know, how do you tell when May apple fruit is ripe? Good question. Okay, so it um, when it's unripe, it's green and it's a little bit hard and it feels thick, like it doesn't really have any give to it. Um, when it's ripe, it turns more of a yellow, like a pale color and it gets soft. So you can kind of, if you have them in your own yard, that's the advantage too. You can check on them every day and kind of see when they're starting to get soft 
then you know, and um, you know, it might be just another day or two. So then you know to go ch check them every day and see if you can get a couple before they're all eaten. <laughs> I thought it was funny you mentioned that they're good for box turtles. So I, yeah. I have recently inherited the TCF box turtle, Sarah, who is in the tank behind me so that she can sit in on the webinars too. Love and <laughs> so I have May apples in my yard. So I'm going to keep an eye on the fruit form. And, yeah, and now you can, yeah, a special treat have something for Sarah. To feed her. Yeah, let um, me know how it goes. Let me know if she likes it. <laughs> <laughs> Already wants to know where can we purchase native plants? That's a great question. Um, the Conservation Foundation actually just had a native plant sale. Um, usually, typically in May, a lot of places will, like master gardeners and um, master naturalist groups will host plant sales, a lot of gardening clubs. And so um, there are typically quite a few in May. Now this year was a bit different. Obviously, a lot of things got canceled because of COVID and um, so this year was definitely a harder year to find some of those things. And so the Conservation Foundation sale, it, it, we sold out. I mean, it was so popular because it was you yeah. know, not, um, not as readily available. These things weren't as readily available. But one thing right now is, so I would maybe do, like you can do an online search or, you know, if you do any social media or anything, sometimes you'll see things that are popping up where, there might still be a couple of native plant sales in your area coming up. And if not, this is also the time of year that a lot of people are dividing plants in their own yards. And so they will tend to um, offer things up for free or for trade or maybe sell on places like Marketplace or Craigslist or things like that. Um, and then also, so the Resiliency Institute, if you're local, they are going to be doing a plant swap soon so kind of that same idea where people who have extras from their garden will drop it off and then um, other people can come and you know just do it like a plant swap you drop something off you pick something up you, you're giving what you have extra and picking up what you don't have and you know just kind of a little trade thing and and they're going to manage that with all um, social distancing and and figure that out but that um, things like that that you can look for in your community and and find some plants that way I'm also going to put a plug in um, a nursery that we use very frequently is Possibility Place in Monet. Absolutely. If you don't live close to them, they have started shipping plants. So you can mm. go on their website and order things to ship. Um, I have also used Prairie Moon and Prairie Nursery pretty successfully. They're, I want to say, like Wisconsin and Minnesota. Yeah. Um, and they will also ship plants to you. I have an order coming from Prairie Moon very soon that I'm looking forward to. Yeah. And they actually also will sell seeds. So you can get yes. seeds for some of these things too. Yes. So, which, you know, sometimes you can buy the plant and it might cost a little bit more, but the plant is already, you know, started and established for you. Or you can get seeds and it might cost a little less, but you have to do a little bit more of the nurturing and get it to grow. So, yeah, you know, it takes you have a little a bit options. Longer. Right. Yeah. Uh, Valerie wants to know if elderberry cuttings haven't rooted in water in six weeks, should I try something different? About half of the cuttings did grow roots and I've planted, but the remaining ones are only growing leaves. Oh, the remaining ones are growing leaves, but not roots. Um, they might not root. They might still, if they're, if they're putting out leaves, it might be kind of like, you know, forcing a forsythia where you take a cutting and bring it in and it will bloom. But if it, if it's not making roots, it is still possible that they might, um, they might still take root, but if they haven't by now and all the rest of them have, it wouldn't hurt if you have them available to be able to take new cuttings. Um, to try some new pieces and just make sure that everything that you're cutting is like pencil thickness um, and nothing too, too small because a lot of times those won't root. Um, so that's just maybe another thing to consider is just making sure that you're getting a good size cutting. All right. D says, I have an area of three black walnuts that I can move some ginger to. Any other plants to put in with it? It's a five by five triangle area. Sure. Yeah. Um, so the ones that I listed off at the very beginning, some of the smaller ones in that list were um, May apple and the wild ginger, wild grapes, um, the wild black raspberries. Those are all good understory things. Even hazelnuts you could plant under there. If it's only five, you know, five feet, you don't have room for anything really large, but those are some of the plants that will do well under there, just that I had kind of mentioned today. 
Um, but I would also look at the Morton Arboretum website because they've got a really good resource and it, it lists a lot more plants. I was mostly talking about ones that are edible, but there are other plants that will do well under, their, under the black walnuts also. So I would look at their resource. That's a really good, just nice, easy checklist to look at and see you know, what will do well with black walnut. Okay, and uh, are there varieties of ground cherries or physalis that don't produce edible fruit? We have several in my yard and they seem to produce the lanterns but rarely have anything bigger than a pea and it never appears to ripen. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I have those in my yard too, um, out at the back of my yard. We get those. And at first, when I first saw them, I was so excited, like, oh, I've got wild ground cherries. And they are. But unfortunately, yeah, sometimes they don't ripen fully. Um, they are edible, actually. So, but they generally aren't much bigger than a pea. And sometimes they don't ripen all the way. Ground cherries in general need kind of a long growing season. So it kind of depends on the season. If they don't come up until a little bit, later in the season, they might not ripen before it gets cold. So it, it, the, the spring conditions have to be kind of just right for them to germinate and sprout early enough where they can maybe get ripe all the way, you know, before it gets cold. So sometimes you won't get any ripe fruit at all. But those, those same ones that, um, that you're talking about, just, you know, um, if they turn, you just want to make sure, again, be careful with your plant ID. There are certain things that you don't want to eat um, for sure in that family. Um, but if you're actually, yeah, you've got the ground cherries, they, they might ripen if it's a good year for them, but they're very tiny. So yeah, the uh, cultivated varieties of those are easy to grow, very prolific, and give you much bigger, sweeter, you know, really good fruit. So if you have space for them in your garden, they're great to have. And also, um, I thought it was actually really cool that the Conservation Foundation, you know, I mentioned the organic farm, they actually offer ground cherries as part of their farm share, which is um, so unique. It's it's really cool because that's not something you typically find in the grocery store very often. So, I got yeah. some last year. They were they were very interesting. There's, yeah, yeah, I really like them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can I plant wild ginger on a berm under some pine trees? Yes. Um, pine trees sometimes when if the needles are very thick underneath. They can kind of act as a mulch and some things don't want to do well. Uh, violets typically will and ginger should. What would you say on that one, Jamie? I don't know of any reason it wouldn't grow under a pine tree, but in general that shady type of an area under trees is a really good spot for wild ginger. I can actually say from experience, I have, when I, when I first moved into my yard, the original developer threw in about a dozen pine trees and called it a day. Mm. And that was the extent of my landscaping. So um, I have a little cluster of various evergreens and I have a bunch of wild ginger growing underneath them. Perfect. So yeah. it's, doing, it's doing really well. Um, I also have in that area Virginia water leaf, um, which some people say gets aggressive, um, mm. but maybe it's because of the pine trees. I don't know. It's not for me. It just made a nice little patch. Um, but the ginger loves it, so. Okay, good. And and so the other thing with that too, mentioning the berm, is that, you know, plants with rhizomes like that that are kind of connected underneath the ground, those will typically do well on a, you know, a bit of a hill or a slope or a berm or hillside too. They're not a really deep-rooted type of a thing, but they kind of connect to each other, you know, to form that mat. So they're, they should work nicely on a berm as well. Um, going into the chat, Beth asks, can you eat the gooseberry raw? Yes, yeah. Gooseberry does not need to be cooked. It's a really good fresh eating berry. You can pick them right off the bush and pop them in your mouth. They're delicious. Uh, let's see. Susan reminds us violets from a pesticide sprayed yard shouldn't be eaten. Correct, yes. And I think that's all the questions that we had. Oh, okay. wait, one more just popped up. Okay. Um, can wild ginger grow in an area under maples that gets swampy after it rains? Swampy. If it's damp, I would say yes, definitely. Damp, moist, that's fine. If it's really swampy, they might not. It depends on how much water the ground is holding. If it's, you know, too wet, some things um, will tend to rot a little bit just from sitting in standing water. So um, I think maybe it depends on how much water we're talking about or how long it's swampy for. If it's continuously swampy, Maybe not. Um, you might want to look at some rain garden type plants and 
um, you know, that might do, might do well in that area, you can always try it. I'm all for experimentation and seeing what will work. So, um, you know, if it's something really expensive and you don't want to take a chance, then I, that's understandable. But if you can get some, you know, little bit of ginger and tuck it in where you want it and see if it does well, maybe it'll thrive. And, but typically if it's too wet, I, I would say that's not its preferred environment. Yeah, I actually, I just, for fun, pulled it up on Possibility Places website. Anytime I'm unsure of the growing conditions for something, they have a great plant finder. And yeah. they say wild ginger prefers dry to moist mesic. Mesic mm -hmm. means like that middle ground soil. Yeah, so medium. that Goldilocks, not too wet, not too dry. So yeah. a little bit more under the wet side they can take, but I wouldn't, anything that gets too much standing water for too long, I don't think they're going to be very happy. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That that word swampy might make the difference. So yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm probably going to pronounce your name wrong. Uh, Wilina commented as a statement, not a question, lamb's quarters are very tasty and nutritious and grow locally. They are. They're not native. So that wasn't one that I was talking about today, but they it's one of my favorite plants to eat. That's a weed that pops up in my yard. Weed, I say in, in quotation marks um, to me. I mean, they're like a, it's like spinach that just volunteers in my yard. It's, it's a great plant, but it's not native. So it just didn't, yeah, yeah didn't make it into my slides, but. <laughs> and I'm sure there are hundreds more that you could have included. I know oh, that's always so many I have with my webinars. There's so much I want to talk about, but. Yes, I was all. really trying to narrow it down <laughs> just to fit into an hour and cover what I could and figured it was a good starting point and you know maybe down the road we could do another one we could do a whole thing on edible invasives yeah yes garlic mustard go eat the garlic I, that's mustard. exactly what i was thinking i can include <laughs> my, my recipe for garlic mustard dip yeah Ooh, yum. <laughs> <laughs> anyway well thank you connie for doing this for us this was great um with all of the huge response that we got to this i really do appreciate uh, everybody joining us and, um, and, and joining us for all of our webinars. Again, a reminder, everything is going to be posted on our YouTube site. Uh, Deborah wants recipes. I do too. Um, maybe, I don't know if Resiliency puts out a cookbook or anything like that. There's they something do, on our actually. website. Maybe. Yeah, they've got a, an edible wild plants certificate class that that is taught every year it runs through the full year it meets once per month and at the end of the year um, they put together a cookbook that's made up of all of the students recipes that they've learned throughout the year so yeah that's always fun yeah there you go yeah. so anyway thank you everyone and we hope to see you again next week at our next webinar so thanks take care everybody thank Be you safe.